Okay. Okay. So good afternoon and welcome to a COPD patient event seminar on new treatment options for COPD patients. My name is Susan Estrella Eats. I'm a nurse practitioner here at the Temple Lung Center. I'm a state captain with the COPD Foundations and I lead the Better Breathers COPD support group at Temple. I'm going to be moderating the discussion today. I am lucky enough to be joined today by Dr. Nat Marchetti, who is one of our pulmonologists here at the Temple Lung Center. We will also be joined by Gigi Thomas, program coordinator at the Temple Lung Center in our BLVR program, and Penny Morlack, a patient who underwent bronchoscopic lung volume reduction here at Temple. Welcome everybody, thanks for joining us. In just a few minutes, Dr. Marchetti will provide a brief overview of COPD and present some new treatment options. You will hear a lot of great information, but please note that our panelists cannot provide personal medical advice during this seminar. The live Q&A is intended to provide you with a general information to help you make decisions, but it is not a substitute for medical advice. The following presentations and testimonials will open up the following the presentations and testimonials. We will go ahead and open up the Q&A for our panelists. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A at any time, and we will address them after the presentations. You may also raise your hand by using the raise hand feature at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions at that time. So without further ado, let me please um, introduce Dr. Nathaniel Marchetti, and he's gonna get it started for us. Okay, thank you, Susan. And uh, I just wanna thank everybody for taking the time to uh, figure out how to get onto the program and listen to us, we uh, appreciate it. Um, as Susan said, my name is Nat Marchetti. I am one of the pulmonary physicians here at Temple. And I'm gonna give a, a, a brief overview of COPD and treatments been focused the latter half of the talk on new therapies. I'm gonna try to get this done in 20 to 25 minutes so we have time for our panelists and for questions. There we go, perfect. And then um, the next thing, there we go, now they're advancing. Okay, so I wanna start just by a definition of COPD. This is a definition that's a classic medical definition as described by the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease. This is a worldwide organization, the abbreviation is GOLD. And the, I'm not gonna read the definition, but the take home points are that COPD is common and I wanna stress that it's preventable, and most importantly, which is why everyone's here today, that it's treatable. And it's characterized by persistent respiratory symptoms, meaning shortness of breath and airflow limitation, which I'm gonna show you. And it's caused by some noxious particle or gas. And I listed here the most common causes, by far and away, cigarette smoking is number one, but these other components also contribute, including air pollution and occupational exposure to different substances. Um, I just want to review these uh, pulmonary function testing. So this is how we make the diagnosis of COPD. It can be suggested by a chest x-ray or CAT scan, but the diagnosis has to hinge upon pulmonary function testing. And, and none of the patients like to do this. Um, it's not a fun test. It's hard for anyone to do, including myself, but we get very valuable information. When you do this test, the spirometry portion, take a deep breath and you blow out as hard as you can. That's all there that you can suck in and blow out. Uh, we call that the forced vital capacity. And that's listed here, FEC. It turns out that in the first one second, we call that the FEV1 forced expiratory volume in one second, two thirds of the air or basically 70% should come out. So the lungs should empty very fast. So what we do is we measure how much you blow out in one second divided by all the air you blow out, this FEV1 over FEC. And we look at the ratio pre and then after pre and post after bronchodilators. And in this individual's case, you can see that the level is well below 70. This is airflow obstruction. To judge the severity, we look at how far suppressed or how low the FEV1 is. So for this individual, it should be three and a half or 3.6 liters. We can see it's a 0.7, only 19% are predicted. So if you have trouble getting air out, but not trouble getting air in, 
you can get very hyperinflated and gas trapped, which is one of the things that we'll be talking about throughout the afternoon here, throughout the hour. So in this individual, the total lung capacity should be 7.4 liters. We can see it's 8.7 liters, which is 117% I predicted. It's too big. The residual volume, this is how much air is left after you blow everything out. It's never zero. It should be about 2.6. In this individual, you can see it's 6.2, which is 240% bigger than it should be. There's a lot of gas trapping. Um, and, and this means that the lung is, that this residual volume is 2.4 times bigger than it should be. This leads to a lot of shortness of breath. And this is the goal of reducing lung volumes by trying to reduce this number. The last thing we'll look at is the diffusion capacity, the DLCO. This measures how well oxygen gets across the lung membrane. And so in this individual, it's very low, also around 18 or 19 percent of predicted. This is how I make the diagnosis. Another common question, the reason I include this slide is, well, what's the obstruction from? Why do you get this obstruction to airflow? Why can't I exhale? Well, it can be, because, it can be for two reasons. One of them due to emphysema, the other due to small airways disease. And these are two photomicrographs. So this is lung tissue that was resected from somebody that underwent lung volume reduction surgery here at Temple. And in this photomicrograph, this picture on the left, this is an airway, and you can see that this airway should be round, but it's oval shaped, it's collapsed on itself. All this stuff out here is the little air sacs. It should be much tighter and smaller, but they're very loose. And doesn't this look, remind you of an overstretched rubber band? And what happens is normally this should be nice and taut to pull on this airway to hold it open. But as you develop emphysema, you develop a loss of elastic recoil. These rubber bands become lax and you don't hold the airway open so that when you exhale, the airway closes prematurely and air gets trapped in behind. That's the obstruction and emphysema. Compare and contrast that in people that have small airways disease. Here's an airway and you can see the difference right away in this airway compared to this one. It might be more roundish, but it's awful thin and it's very thick. The walls are very thick. So there's a lot of edema and inflammation and swelling in these airways. You even get some fibrosis and scarring in the airway here. These little blue dots are inflammatory cells and that narrows the airway. Also, you can get debris and mucus in this airway, which will further occlude it. Now this picture doesn't show that, but you can get even more occlusion with debris and mucus in the airway. So this is where at a microscopic level where the obstruction occurs in patients that have COPD. So the treatment, we're not gonna go through every one of these. That would be a two or three hour lecture. Uh, but these are some of the treatments for COPD. Smoking cessation is obviously key. Uh, we'll talk about inhalers, oxygen therapy, preventing exacerbations is important. We'll mention pulmonary rehab, but we'll talk a lot about lung reduction too. So inhaled medications. They're the mainstay of treatment. It's what the first line of therapy is. It doesn't improve survival or necessarily alter the course of the disease. Um, the goal of the therapy is to decrease symptoms and improve your quality of life and to reduce the number of flare-ups that people get. We don't have to go through this word for word, but there's a different groups of these medications. There's short-acting medicines like albuterol and atrovine or ipratropium. These are medicines that kick in very fast, but they don't last very long. So this is a great rescue inhaler. So the rescue medications or the as-needed inhalers are usually short-acting meds that come on quick, but go away quick. We use long-acting medications that will last either 12 hours or 24 hours, depending on the drug. Sometimes they're combined with an inhaled steroid. Um, sometimes they're used alone. And um, there are now another new category of medications where you have all three meds together. You have what's called a long-acting muscarinic agent, a llama drug, a long-acting form of albuterol, and an inhaled steroid. We call that triple therapy. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but that's the different categories of medications. Um, just to give an idea of what to expect from this as far as lung function, this is a, a classic study that's uh, been around forever and it's very similar to other more recent uh, bronchodilator studies. This is using teotropium, uh, Spiriva, and you can see day zero, three weeks, and six weeks, the improvement you get in the lung function. So even on the first day, there's some improvement in the lung function, the FEV going up by 0.2 liters, um, which lasts out as long as six weeks as the patient's taking the drug. What I want you to notice here is that you might not get a huge improvement in your FEV1, but you get a nice improvement in your lung volumes. Remember this residual volume, how much air is left? It goes down by almost a half a liter. So this is very important in using these medications to try to help deflate the lung, to allow more room to breathe. 
Um, these medications can prevent and reduce exacerbations. This is a, uh, with a medication called Trelogy. It's triple therapy. It's three drugs and one inhaler, which is represented by the blue line. This is time out to a year. This blue line is lower than the yellow or the green, um, showing you and demonstrating that they have less uh, exacerbations over time. So this is the percentage of subjects who had a moderate or severe exacerbation. That means people that had an exacerbation that required treatment with steroid or a visit to the hospital or emergency room. Now, I said earlier that these inhalers probably don't improve mortality, but we're starting to get some hints that maybe they do. This is another drug called Brestree. Uh, it's a triple inhaled therapy. And this blue line is their high dose inhaled steroid triple therapy inhaler that suggests that there might be an improvement in their uh, survival. So again, the study was empowered to look at survival, but there's a clue here that, that it might help improve survival using triple therapy. Um, this is you know, not proven, but it's certainly suggested. It does make some sense. If you have less exacerbations, you would think you'd have a better long-term outcome. Oxygen therapy, everyone's favorite topic. You qualify for oxygen if you have a saturation below 88% or have an oxygen level below 55 um, on an arterial blood gas. This can be done um, at rest or, or during exertion. Um, one thing about oxygen is it should be titrated during exertion. So we'll get a six minute walk test, have you walk for six minutes and, and make sure that you're getting enough oxygen when you're walking. Um, this criteria have been around since the mid to late 1980s and hasn't really changed. Uh, a few years ago, we looked at the use of oxygen in patients who didn't quite meet that criteria at rest, but they went below 88% with, uh, um, with walking. Um, and <clears throat> what we found is, that, you know, we took those people who didn't quite meet the criteria at rest, but did when they walked, we divided them into two groups. Half of them got oxygen and half of them didn't get oxygen. And we thought that the people who would get oxygen would do better, meaning that they'd have less hospitalizations, um, less uh, mortality, less death. But it turned out that there was no difference between that group. Um, now, this is not the people who are below 88% at rest. Everybody knows and agrees that that group at rest, if your oxygen level is below 88% at rest, that you should use supplemental oxygen and it will improve your survival. We're talking about the group here, so who is okay at rest, but has their oxygen level go down when they walk. It turned out it didn't really make much of a difference for them. That doesn't mean that they can't use it, but it, overall, it didn't have the effect that we thought that it would have. So if I told you about this new intervention for COPD that improved the quality of life, reduces shortness of breath, reduces hyperinflation or dynamic hyperinflation, improves exercise performance, was cheap, effective, and had minimal side effects, I'm sure everybody would sign up for it. It turns out that this isn't a new therapy, but it is somewhat underutilized. And I'm talking about pulmonary rehab. Um, you know, multiple studies over the years have shown that pulmonary rehab is a very effective treatment where patients go and exercise a couple times a week. Um, and, and at the end of it, after, um, after some time, they'll start, they, they do have an improvement in their exercise performance, meaning they can walk further. They have an improvement in their quality of life and an improvement in their shortness of breath. One of the downsides to this is that you have to continue with an exercise regimen or program afterwards or else you can slide back. And certainly it doesn't cure people with COPD, but it can make it more tolerable. And before we talk, before, patients move on to more advanced, invasive, and more risky or dangerous therapies, everybody should be maximally treated with the inhalers that we talked about very briefly, oxygen if they need it, and pulmonary rehab. So to change gears a little bit, I just wanted to talk about this concept of hyperinflation. We talked about the residual volume, that's how much air is left after you breathe out being too high. Um, and we talked about the total lung capacity being too high. And again, this occurs because the air gets in fine, but it doesn't get out very well. And initially you might think that having more air in your chest is better, but it, it's not because it, it takes up space in your chest and it doesn't allow for any room for fresh air to come in. And just having overinflated lung volumes can make you feel incredibly short of breath. And anyone who doesn't have COPD can simulate this by just taking a very deep breath, the total lung capacity all the way up and just let out a little bit of air and try to stay at that lung volume and walk around. It'll be impossible for anyone uh, to do that. And that's how uh, most people with COPD that have hyperinflation feel every minute of every day. To make matters worse, 
this hyperinflation gets worse when you exercise because when you exercise, which could be just walking up the steps, you breathe faster. If you breathe faster, you have less time to exhale air and you're gonna trap even more air in your chest. And that leads to more hyperinflation. We call that dynamic because it's changing. Um, this is an example here um, of a normal individual and somebody with COPD. This is their minute ventilation. This is basically how much they're breathing. But you, you could, it would be the same, it would look the same if you put time here. Um, you can see the normal individual can increase their minute ventilation or exercise long time. Somebody with COPD has to stop right away. One of the things you notice here is this EELV, end expiratory lung volume. The amount of air left in your chest after you exhale. In a normal individual, even though they might be breathing 30, 40 times a minute as they exercise, that end expiratory lung volume represented by this lighter shade of gray, it stays the same. Look what happens to somebody with COPD. Not only do they start higher, so there's less room for fresh air, but as they exercise, their respiratory rate might get up into the 20s, or even touch 30, but they'll begin to trap more air in their chest and their end expiratory lung volume. The amount of air in their chest after they exhale rises, leading to even more shortness of breath leading them to stop exercise to slow the respiratory rate down and empty out the lung. So the medical treatments that we do, the bronchodilators, the pulmonary rehab, oxygen, if you need it, those can help. But as you know, it's not perfect for us. We wouldn't have other more advanced procedural interventions to help with this problem. So one of the first things that we did, we said, well, look, we'll just cut out part of the lung. And it's very counterintuitive. It doesn't make any sense at all that if you can't breathe, that if we remove one third of your, of your lung, you'd breathe better on each side, one third on each side. Well, it turned out to be true. This is called lung volume reduction surgery. So in patients that had more emphysema in these upper lobes, if you remove that emphysema, this area, got rid of it, the lower lobes then could be better situated and have empty better and not have as much air trapping and gas trapping and patients would feel better. And it turned out, if you look at this, we've been doing this for a long time now, probably more than somewhere around 20 years, um, where we've known that those that had surgery represented by this line here, actually over time, this is out to seven, eight years, they had an improved survival compared to those who did not get surgery. These are people with upper low predominant disease and low exercise, meaning they couldn't pedal bike for a long time versus those who could pedal a little bit longer the survival advantage was still there, although it took a little longer and it's not as robust as the sicker group. But if you have upper lobe predominant emphysema, meaning more emphysema in the top part of the lung than anywhere else, and you were very hyperinflated, if we cut out the top third of the lung, you did better. Very counterintuitive. And so not surprisingly, people weren't so excited to go get their chest cut open. So that's why we transitioned more in the, re the field in this area of uh, COPD research, transitioned to trying to find less invasive ways to do this. So this is where bronchoscopic lung volume reduction comes in. So there's a couple ways to do this. You can look at targeted lobe atelectasis, meaning you're gonna focus on the right upper lobe or whatever lobe has the most emphysema. And you're gonna put one-way valves in there to block the air so that the lung deflates. Another technique, which we'll just mention briefly, these uh, coils, which, did not get FDA approved here in the US that go in and, and, and coil into the lung and cause the lung volume to shrink down. You could also go into certain regions of the lung, maybe not the entire lobe, but just a part of the lobe and, and put something in there, biologic lung volume reduction that would cause scarring and fibrosis that would shrink the lung down that way. Um, this was very effective, but the problem with it, this technique was it was a little bit too toxic for patients. So that went back to the drawing board that's being worked on now to try to improve that. There's another technique called bronchoscopic thermal vapor ablation where you put steam into the lung to try to, to, try to damage or cause scarring in the emphysematous areas. Um, that's under development. But right now, what we have when we're looking at this, so these endobronchial valves, there are two that are FDA approved and they're both listed here. The lung coil did not get approved in the United States. The lung sealant was too toxic. This is where you put this chemical into the lung causing scarring and fibrosis. That's back to the drawing board. And these two techniques are still in, in a research phase. Now, one thing when, and Gigi will touch about on this, I'm sure, but one of the, the issues with the lung volume reduction with an endobronchial valve is that it, this concept of collateral ventilation. This is a very difficult concept to understand. So I made these somewhat poorly drawn, but you'll get the point, pictures. So it turns, if you look at, this is a drawing of the left lung. And this is a fissure that separates the upper lobe from the lower lobe. 
This is your trachea. This is the airway to the upper lobe and airway to the lower lobe. Most of us are like this picture here on the right, where you have the fissure and there's these little holes in the fissure, and we call that collateral ventilation. It turned out that in the very first iteration of the valves that patients, when we did the procedure, not everybody benefited. In fact, a minority benefited. And it turned out that you had to have um, collateral ventilation negative. If you had collateral ventilation, it didn't work. And this is why. So we'll go through the CV collateral ventilation negative case first. So if we're going to put valves, it's with this X is, and it's far more complex than this. I just do it for simplicity. It's usually not one valve. It's much more, not much more, but four or five valves typically. But first, for this drawing, one valve to block up the airway. So air is going to come in. Obviously, if air tries to go into the upper lobe, because you have these valves here, it's going to be impeded. It won't inflate the lung. It'll bounce off and go somewhere else. And air is going to go into the lower lobe. And if your fissure is intact, the air will go up to this fissure and sort of circle around in the lower lobe. It will not get into here. So in this case, in this individual, the collateral ventilation is negative. And this person should do well with endobronchial valves, provided they meet the other criteria. They're hyperinflated and they've got a lot of emphysema. If you compare this to a CV positive, collateral ventilation positive, so you can see air is still blocked because we put a valve here, but the air that gets into the lower lobe will sort of enter the upper lobe through this back door. These are called pores of con. That's the name of these holes, but they, they'll reinflate this upper lobe. So you could put all the valves you want in this upper lobe, it's going to still get inflated sort of through the back door. And in this case, the patient won't get any benefit. So it's really important if you're considering endobronchial valve therapy that you have to have this collateral ventilation be negative. And we can talk later about how to determine that. So what do the valves do? So this is from the Liberate trial, the Zephyr valve. These are the primary and secondary outcomes. So the study to randomize patients to either valve placement or standard medical therapy. And we looked at the data at 12 months. Um, if you look at the, the percentage of subjects that had an improvement in their FEV1 by at least 15%, it's about half of them compared to only 17% in the medical therapy group. If you look at how far, um, well, this is the uh, absolute change. It went up by 100 milliliters, the FEV1. The six-minute walk distance improved some too significantly, but what really was impressive is the drop in their St. George Restoration Questionnaire score, this SGRQ. The lower this is, the better. And a drop by four points is considered meaningful to the patient. So it was going down by uh, around eight, more than double what's considered meaningful. Responder rates. So this is the percentage of subjects that got better. This is one of the most common questions that we'll get in valves. What are my chances of feeling better and, and doing better and having lower lung volumes? This is the answer to your questions. So if you look at an improvement in your FEV1, around two thirds, six, almost 60% will have an improvement in their FEV1 by greater than 12%. Um, two thirds will meet the criteria with have a reduction in their residual volume, a reduction in the lung volume. About two thirds, 56% will have an improvement in their quality of life as measured by the St. George Restoration Quotient. That's a drop of my, by more than four. Um, the six minute walk distance is improved in about 42%. This is a measure of shortness of breath is improved by in about half of the patients. This number here is the a total out of the target lung volume reduction. So that lobe that we treat going down by more than 350 milliliters, that's considered a significant amount. 84% of the people had that improvement. So in general, about two thirds of the patients are gonna feel better. And probably the most important number on here is your improvement in your quality of life, because that's what you're really looking for. Most patients don't care if the residual volume goes down by 0.5 or one liter, they just wanna feel better. Complications, the pneumothorax rate is around 30% or, or just under 30%, no matter which valve you get. And it tends to occur early. This is when the, the number of events, day zero through five, oops, day zero through five, you can see that most of them occur in the first few days. It's for this reason that you stay in the hospital following this procedure for up to four days so that we can monitor for this pneumothorax. The pneumothorax or collapsed lung, which I'll show you a picture of here, is dangerous, it, it, you'll feel more short of breath, but it's very treatable. So what is it? So this is your CAT scan. This is the lung here in the lower lobe. This is a valve and the lung collapsed around this valve and some air leaked outside the lung and we have air inside the chest wall, but outside the lung. And that's what a pneumothorax is. And so this is 
we take your patients to CAT scan. We work closely with interventional radiologists. We feel this is the best way to do it because we can precisely put the tube where we want it. This is a needle. We thread the tube, a wire, and then the tube goes over the wire into the patient's chest. And this tube is connected to suction. We suck this air out and the lung can re-expand. It's a very treatable problem um, and it's um, uh, easily handled, but you have to be, have access to, we have to have access to, so that's why you have to stay in the hospital for four days. This is an example of one of my patients that underwent lung bomb reduction through a bron uh, bronchoscopy with an endobronchial valve. This is a pre-chest x-ray. You can see his upper lobes is very hyperinflated. Um, <clears throat> this is the first day, or the day of the procedure. Focus on this right upper lobe, which is where we put the valves in. The valves are very hard to see. You won't be able to see them, but this is already starting to shrink down. This line is where the lung is, is shrinking. And you can see in the next day, the upper lobe is getting smaller and smaller to a point where it's completely collapsed. By the time he went home, look how much smaller the lung is compared to this side. And what did this mean to the patient? Well, <clears throat> his lung function improved from 36% of predicted up to 54%. And his residual volume went from 170% down to 79% of predicted. And these numbers are important, but most importantly, he had a dramatic improvement in his quality of life and felt like he could walk around some. Uh, it didn't lead to no shortness of breath, but it led to an improvement in how far he could walk. How long does this last? Well, here's some data emerging now. This is a, some data showing that there's a reduction in shortness of breath at one year post valve. If you look at this MMRC, which is a, how short of breath they are, the patients had an improvement still at one year over 50, about just about 50% of them. Um, this is a measurement of shortness of breath after your walk test. This is important to bring up because even though you have the valve, even though you might feel better to walk further, you're still going to get to some point where you develop shortness of breath and have to stop. This is just a reminder that these valves aren't a cure for emphysema or COPD. Um, you're still going to experience some shortness of breath, but hopefully you're walking further and feel better. Um, again, just looking at the six minute walk distance, this is activity responders at one year. People are still walking further. They had less shortness of breath um, with their, with, with their um, this is a transitional dyspnea index and uh, a measure of how short of breath they were. And this is the activity domain in the St. George Restoration Quotient. So patients were still walking further. This slide here demonstrates over time up to a year in patients that had endobronchial valves compared to those that had standard of care. This does this all the time. So. And what you can see is there's an improvement in your emphysema symptom intensity score after, right after valve treatment. And what's really nice and reassuring here is that this lasted up to a year. Doesn't mean they don't have shortness of breath. It just means compared to not getting valves, they do better at least up to a year. Um, I'm going to talk about transplant for one, one slide only. Um, you know, it's a very high morbidity and high mortality. Um, uh, it's much riskier than any lung bomb reduction surgery procedure, and it should be used when everything else has failed. We typically will start to list patients for lung transplant when your FAV1 falls in this 15 to 20%, or if they have a lot of exacerbations requiring hospitalizations, or they have high carbon dioxide levels. And if you have pulmonary hypertension, would also be a reason. But transplant is an option, and we reserve it for the absolute last because it is the riskiest. Mm -hmm. Now, the new targets, we're already using these. The research has shown them to be effective. Those are endobronchial valves. I mentioned earlier about some of the other lung reduction techniques that are in development, but what about treating mucus and hypersecretion? We have a couple um, studies open to look at treating airways uh, to reduce mucus production. I'll show you those. There's also another procedure called targeted lung denervation. I'll explain that in a second to help with this disease as well. And some patients have this dynamic airway collapse, meaning when they exhale, the airways collapse. There's research being done and work being done and using stents and other procedures to help those patients. This targeted lung denervation, it's experimental right now. There's an open clinical trial. This has preliminary results are very promising. We're now involved in the study that's uh, both being conducted here in the United States and in Europe. The definitive study to show that this is effective the idea here is that you do this um, radio frequency ablation. There's a catheter that goes through a bronchoscope into the airway, and it heats up the uh, uh, airway wall, and it damages these nerves that line the lung. Well, why would you want to damage these nerves? Because when you do, it leads to the airway becoming bigger. You'll get bronchodilation, and you'll get some mucus reduction, hopefully. And this is what Spiriva does. We use this 
uh, medications work on these nerves. We're doing it with a different technique. And the goal of the study is to see if we can reduce flare-ups and improve symptoms, including mucus production, dyspnea, or shortness of breath, and improve quality of life. Another procedure that's uh, currently in development and is an open clinical trial also being conducted here in the United States and, uh, um, and in Europe is a cryospray where liquid nitrogen is sprayed into the airways. The idea here is for patients that have flare-ups and exacerbations and it make a lot of mucus on a chronic basis. Um, this is, a, a, again, a photomicrograph, a microscopic view of the airway. This is the lining of the airway, and this is a blow-up picture of that. So these goblet cells here are what make mucus. And in patients that have problems with mucus production, we know that not only do you make more of these goblet cells in your airways, but these goblet cells are overactive and they make more mucus. So the idea here is that you put liquid nitrogen, which freezes the airway. Obviously, you're using very minute amounts. And this airway is damaged and it sloughs off. It's sort of like the skin of the airway. And when it regrows back, we hope that it will grow back with more normal epithelium and more normal goblet cells so that you have less mucus production. Again, preliminary results are encouraging, but we're involved in the open clinical trial to prove or disprove whether this therapy works or not. The last one is called bronchorealplasty. Again, this is for patients with a lot of mucus. There's this electrode, it's a basket shape that goes into the airway and some energy is delivered. It's a, it's a pulsed electrical field. It's not thermal, it's very short duration, you know, it doesn't burn the airway, but we hope that it also damages this epithelial lining. When it regrows, you have less mucus producing cells. And this is a picture, a cartoon drawing, but this is what it actually looks like. This is um, a study that we were involved in a small pilot study last year. And just now, last month, a new study opened again, a pivotal study that hopefully will show that this works. This is a before of somebody's airway. Uh, you can see mucus lying in the airway. And then after, uh, on a repeat bronchoscopy, there certainly was less mucus apparent. Whether this works or not, again, we're trying to figure that out. Um, there's an open clinical trial for that. So in summary, you know, you need a multifaceted approach to COPD. Um, inhalers, we know, don't work alone. We'll need to use medical therapy, maximize inhaler use, maximize oxygen if you need it, get you to pulmonary rehab. But if that's not working, it's not meeting the therapeutic goals, meaning you're still short of breath, then you can consider these more advanced options, including procedures like lung bomb reduction surgery, bronchoscopic lung bomb reduction, and obviously transplant's always the last option, or you can consider enrolling in a clinical trial if you have mucus secretion in particular, uh, or exacerbations or flare-ups. So let me stop there. I know that's quick. We'll talk about, we'll go to all the questions once everything is uh, completed. So I'll just pass it over back to Susan and she can introduce Gigi. Okay, Gigi, take it away. Thank you, Susan. Hi, uh, my name is Gigi Thomas and I am the program coordinator for bronchoscopic uh, scopic lung volume reduction procedure or the BLVF uh, procedures at Temple Lung Center. So I'll be talking today about um, patient selection, evaluation, and uh, the testings that are required. Uh, so to be considered for the BLVR, uh, the patient must uh, have a diagnosis of emphysema which is confirmed based on the CT scans. And uh, you know when they see the doc uh, doctors here, they will look at all the records to confirm the patient have emphysema. Uh, the other thing that we look at is uh, their body mass index. It should be less than 32. Uh, Dr. Tanner, uh, Dr. Marquette spoke about the FEV1 uh, and the PFTs. Uh, it has to be above 15%. If it's anywhere less than 15%, that means patients are really sick and they probably need transplant. Uh, we also look at the residual volume. Uh, that's the amount of trapped air in the lungs. It has to be at least 150% uh, or more. So the, uh, for the six mile walk uh, test, patients should walk anywhere from 100 meters to 500 meters. If the walk is less than 100 meters, that means a patient is really sick or patient needs uh, rehab to, uh, to get a little bit better. Uh, patients should not be actively smoking. They should be. Uh, they should have quit smoking at least four weeks, four months prior to 
their evaluation. Um, other things that can exclude, um, exclude you from uh, this procedure is um, if you have prior history of lung transplant, lung volume reduction surgery, or history of lobectomy. Uh, other things are congestive, history of congestive heart failure, unstable cardiac arrhythmias, myocardial infarction, or stroke within the last six months. If you're allergic to nitinol, nickel, titanium, uh, any history of any, any lesions in your lungs or large bulla can exclude you as well. Uh, patients who are high risk for post-operative uh, uh, risk for post-operative morbidity or mortality during a bronchos uh, bronchoscopic procedure will be excluded as well. Or, or any, any other medical condition or circumstances that will a patient is unable to complete the pulmonary diagnostic and uh, therapeutic program required for the procedure can also exclude them. History of uh, severe hypercapnia or like uh, this, you know, found in the arterial blood gas that's done. If the CO2 levels is above 55, then usually the patients are excluded as well. Uh, patients with more than uh, three hospitalization for COPD exacerbation in a year, uh, usually like the first thing will be to see if we can stabilize them and then maybe bring them back or if they're, it's not possible, then you know, send them for transplant. So uh, I'll not talk about uh, the testing that are required for the bronchoscopic lung volume reduction procedure or the valve procedure at Temple. So we do uh, testing uh, three days, which are spread out. Uh, usually all these testing can be done in two weeks. Uh, we start with the first day where we do the pulmonary function testing. Uh, the cardio, uh, we do a cardiopulmonary excise test, which helps us to find about uh, the dynamic uh, hyperinflation in your lungs. Our, we do arterial blood gas, six minute walk test, and a CT scan. The CT scan that's done, it's done under the valve protocol uh, with inspiration and expiration. This CT scan is uploaded to a software, which will tell us how much uh, destruction is in your lungs. Uh, it has to be more than 50% in at least one of the lobes. And Dr. Markety had earlier spoken about those fissures. It has to be at least 80% or more. Anything above 90, 95% is great. Anything above 80%, you will qualify. Uh, usually a week later, because it takes like a few days for us to get the CT results, we'll schedule you for an echocardiography and a nuclear medicine cardiac stress test. This is to make sure that your heart is fine. There is no issue with your heart. But if there is something going on, you will have to, you know, we'll have to uh, take care of that first before we do this, uh, the valve procedure. The last day of testing is uh, we do a nuclear medicine perfusion scan where you get nuclear medicine and we do a low dose CT scan. This particular test will tell us how much blood supply is going into your lungs. So, and on the same day, you will see Dr. Kreiner. Uh, he will review all these uh, testings. And if everything looks good, then we will schedule you for, for the valve procedure two to three weeks from that last visit. If for some reason, like you don't qualify, then Dr. Kanda will talk to you about what other options you have, namely like the medical management or, or lung volume reduction surgery or transplant. All these testing that you did for the valves um, will, can be used for the transplant and lung volume reduction surgery. Um, if you qualify and if you're scheduled for the procedure, uh, usually the week before your procedure, you will come for pre-admission testing where you'll get some lab work, you will see the anesthesiologist. Um, and if you are on any anticoagulants like uh, aspirin or Coumadin, you will have to stop five to seven days before the procedure. Uh, on the day of the procedure, Dr. Marchetti had uh, spoken that, uh, you know, we have to make sure there is no collateral ventilations. So, so once you are under anesthesia, the first thing will be, you know, we'll make sure there is no collateral ventilation. If, if it's showing that there is collateral ventilation, then you will be discharged the same day. Uh, if uh, everything is okay, you're, uh, there's no collateral ventilation, everything looks good, uh, you'll get the valves. And um, uh, on the day of, when you're on the, on the um, before, once you get the valves and before we wake you up, we'll do a chest x-ray to make sure everything is okay. There is no pneumothorax. Uh, and then you are admitted in the hospital for four days to make sure, you know, to watch for this pneumothorax because the risk is usually really high in the first 48 hours. So we'll do chest x-rays every day uh, when you're in the hospital. 
uh, you'll get another x-ray before you get discharged. Uh, once you're discharged, you will come back seven days to 10 days uh, post-procedure. You'll get a chest x-ray uh, and a six mile walk test and you will see uh, the, uh, Dr. Kreiner. Uh, the next one will be usually 45 days to two months from uh, the procedure. At this, at this visit, you will get the pulmonary function test and a six mile walk and a CT scan. This will tell us like how you are doing pre-procedure and post-procedure. We can compare and see like if there are any changes in your pulmonary function, uh, if you, your walk is better, and the CT scan, Dr. Kreiner can review and see if all the valves are correctly placed. If for some reason you don't have much benefit or, or the valves look like you know, they're not correctly placed, Dr. Kreiner might suggest you to do an adjustment procedure. That is to go back in to fix that valve, you know, which probably would have moved. If everything is okay, then you come back at three to four months, you get pulmonary function testing, six month walk, see Dr. Kreiner. Then you come back at six months, um, you do pulmonary function tests, cardiopulmonary exercise tests, blood gas, six mile walk tests, CT scan, echo, nuclear medicine perfusion scan, and uh, see Dr. Treiner. And at one year, you will repeat all these testing as well. After one year, there, there will be yearly follow-ups. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Gigi. That was so much information. We have some great questions coming up for the Q&A later. Um, right now, we're going to go into our patient testimonial. So we'll get Penny on camera here. Hi, Penny. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much again for joining us and um, sharing your story today. Um, I'm just going to kind of let you get started and tell us a little bit about yourself and, and you know, your story, how you, how you developed COPD and how it impacted your life and what made you decide to come and see us and, and how everything's gone since then. Okay. Uh, well, I was born with asthma to begin and go, so I had asthma all my life. Uh, I'm an athlete, so I love sports. I work out at the gym, I play volleyball, I bowl, I play softball, a lot of athletics. I was a hairdresser, so, and I was also a smoker. So a lot of these things added up. Make a long story short, come to about 2017, I started having a lot of trouble breathing, more so than what my asthma ever was. So I asked my primary doctor for a recommendation of a doctor, a pulmonary doctor, went to see him. He did a couple of breathing tests on me and everything and told me that, you know, there was emphysema there. So went to see him for a couple of more visits. Um, I did go to the hospital once because I completely got out of breath. And that was, that was the only recourse was to have the ambulance come and take me to the emergency room. So from there, we just went on for a while, while. And I asked my pulmonary doctor because I've been hearing things about these valves and stuff. And I said, um, I would like to, I think I would like to try that. Should I go over to Temple and see about this? And he had said, well, why don't we try going to see the head of my department, um, which was at another hospital and see what he has to say. So I took his recommendation and I did that. And they put me through all the tests and I was evaluated and said that I could get the valves. So in June, the end of June, 2019, I went in and had the, uh, valve procedure done. And I guess in about four to five weeks after this, I started the rehab program, which is very important. And for about two to three weeks, I was doing fine. I didn't need oxygen. I was doing great. And then all of a sudden, something, something happened. I don't know what it is, but I couldn't breathe anymore. I needed oxygen all the time. So I called, went back to my doctor. He looked at it and he said, well, I think we need to go in and remove the valves. I go and remove them and I'll put different ones in or move them around. So I went back to him, it was late October, early November, 2019, same year. And he did just that. He went in, removed the valves and put larger ones in. And he took four out and put five in, larger ones in. And when I came out of that surgery, I was worse more than ever. 
and I, I just couldn't breathe for anything. I had to be on oxygen 24 hours a day and I couldn't go out of the house in the heat and humidity in the summer, I was just stuck in the house. And I went back to him and I said, look, I'm going for a second opinion. And from that point on, that was, that was I guess, December of 2019. So 2020 in January, I did some research and in January I called up Temple and got myself an appointment at Temple Hospital. So I went in there and I was uh, scheduled to start some testing and they scheduled me late February or early March. And just as I was about to start that testing process, the pandemic happened. So everything was put on hold. So I couldn't do anything, but I remained on oxygen 24 seven. Just, I, I tried to exercise. I tried to do the exercises that I learned in pulmonary rehab at home but it, it really wasn't making much of a difference. And I would do these exercises two or three times a day, walking, walking with weights and everything that I had learned in there, um, but it wasn't happening. So in late August or September, I got a call from Temple saying that I could be scheduled to come in and see Dr. Kreiner there. And from then, that's when everything started. I went through all my testing, all my x-rays, everything that I had to do, and he said, he looked at my x-rays and the problem was is the valves were not placed in the right spot. So he thought that he could make an improvement and he scheduled me to go in and what he did was remove these and go back in and put them in the right spot. And I've been great ever since. Um, I'm back at pulmonary rehab, which is the most important thing um, because even though you don't think it's going to do anything, the longer you go, the better you get. And I go two, sometimes three times a week, and it's for about two, two and a half hours a day. But you get better, your breathing gets better, you can walk longer, you can do things. I don't use oxygen at all now. The only time I do is at night when I sleep because they said your oxygen level drops when you're at rest. So I use it to sleep, but I don't use it at all during the day. And I am going, I went back to pulmonary rehab when the uh, pandemic ended and rehab opened up again, which was after I got my second vaccination in the beginning of April, then I went right back to rehab and I'm there now. Um, and it's great. Uh, you will notice a difference within the first two weeks, even if you couldn't walk from one room to the next. After two weeks, you'll be walking around the house and each day you'll walk further and further and further. So that's kind of where I'm at now. I had spoke to Dr. Kreiner and I asked him, I said, my daughter's getting married in November and I want to be able to dance at her wedding. So they thought that there was a good chance of that. And I think I'll be dancing at her wedding now. That's amazing. What a great story. Yeah, it was, it was, it's amazing. And I was really, I tried to keep myself up, but I mean, it's very depressing when you go from being, leading an active lifestyle to doing nothing but sitting on the couch. There's nothing worse than doing that. I love swimming. I love to be go to the beach in the summertime. And last summer, I wasn't able to do any of that. So it's great. This summer, I'm already in the pool. I, I'm <laughs> doing everything that I normally would do. So you got your life back. Got my life back. And plus, my even with my weight, I'm five foot seven. And when I saw Dr. Kreiner, I was already down to 100 pounds, which is light for a, a five foot seven person. Um, I had always weighed between 120 and 130 my entire life. So now I'm back up to 120. I've gained my 20 pounds. I actually look like a, a real person again instead of a, ske a skeleton. Um, it was just because my lungs were working so hard, I couldn't put on a pound if I wanted to. So now I'm, I'm eating better. I'm doing everything better. And, and I have a life again. That's awesome. I think so many patients are probably you know, hearing your story and really being able to relate to some of what, you know, you felt while you were really in the thick of it, when you were really feeling bad. And it's great to see that, you know, you really pursued, you really were an advocate for yourself and pursued this until you got it right, until you came to the right place. And right. now, um, you know, you've, you've uh, had a much better experience and and you are really kind of flourishing at this point. So that's yes. awesome. Yes, I am. I mean, there's 
nothing stopping me anything now. The only my my goal now is to start bowling again. I, I was a big bowler. I've bowled for 40 years, so that's my next thing. Once the bowling alleys open up again and I can start bowling, because I use a 13 or 14 pound bowling ball, and that's hard to do when you can't breathe. So that'll be my next thing. I'll be I'll be starting to bowl hopefully in a month or two. I'll be able to pick up that bowling ball and throw it again. Well, hopefully we can get uh, we can get you a Temple team shirt or something, so you get uh, <laughs> you can be part of our team forever. <laughs> I love it. Yes, the team there is great. Everybody there is great. Um, from the time you walk in the door, everybody from admissions to the people that are giving you the test, to the doctors, to the the PAs, everybody, everybody is great there. I love Temple. I mean, I I would tell anybody in the world to go to Temple. And I know when I'm at, at therapy, I know from before there was a lot of people, there was people there from Temple and that's where I started asking questions when I started having trouble um, because there was a lot of people from the other hospital that I was at that I got this procedure done first and then there was people from Temple and the people that had were at the hospital that I had the bad procedure done, they were not doing any better either. And the people from Temple were all flourishing so I started asking a lot of questions there, and that's where I got on to this. So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled, oh, that's, I'm thrilled. That's an amazing story. So we're gonna bring Gigi and Dr. Marchetti back into the room, and we're gonna kind of open up for some questions. Penny, we want you to stick around because there's gonna be probably lots of patients who might wanna hear some more about what you have to say. Okay. Um, look here on our questions oh and a lot of people think that they're too old to do things i'm i just turned 68 and i don't consider myself old so there's people older than me in rehab so if you have a positive attitude and you want to do it you can do it absolutely so i saw a question um in the q and a a couple minutes ago um and this was from uh, Kathleen. She wanted to know how the weight impacts the ability to be a candidate for BLVR. So um, I'll, I'll answer that one. Um, there's really a couple different things that will factor into it. So um, first of all, if somebody's body mass index is well above 32, it's very unlikely that they're gonna have the high lung volumes that they would benefit from reducing them. So if you don't have high lung volumes, you're not going to you're not going to um, get a benefit from an endobronchial valve. The um, <clears throat> the reason for that is as we gain weight across our abdomen, it tends to push upward into the chest and makes the lung volume small. Um, the other reason is that even if by chance you did have very high lung volumes, which again is unusual, but you know it could happen, if you did have very high lung volumes, you wouldn't get as much of a benefit. Uh, because the obesity would be playing a role in limiting your ability to walk further and feel better. Um, and then finally, if you do have a complication of a pneumothorax, then it will be very, it'll be much more difficult to get a chest tube in place in the proper position safely as well. So the complications are harder to handle. And probably the most important reason is that in, in these initial studies, patients with, with a BMI, body mass index about 32 and above 35, were excluded from, from, from participating. So we don't wanna, you know, we don't wanna extend this procedure outside of the group that we know that it works in because although it works and it can work great, and, and Penny's a very good example of both the good and the bad things about it. I mean, the valve can work wonderful, but can also make you feel worse. Um, so we, we are very selective and careful in who we put it in, and we don't want to do our own uncontrolled experiments by expanding that outside of patients that were included in the clinical research trial showing that they were effective. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, just scroll through and see if we had any other questions. Uh, Dr. Arcetti, what does the role of pulmonary rehab play in getting these patients ready for a procedure? Well, I think Penny answered that for us. She was like the best advertisement for pulmonary rehab I've heard in the last five years. So, um, I mean, uh, you know, anytime we put you through a procedure, we want you in as much 
is the best physical shape you could possibly be in. Um, and so the, the, if you want to get the maximal benefit, you know, we want to treat patients beforehand to get them as feeling as well as humanly possible. There is no way that I'm saying pulmonary rehab and inhalers will cure your emphysema or COPD, and you may still need the procedure. But you got to go through that before you do something that's much more risky. The risk of these valves is way greater than anything the pulmonary rehab offers. I mean, pulmonary rehab is so safe and so effective um, that everyone needs to do it first. Then if you go through pulmonary rehab and, and, and God forbid, you do get the complication of a pneumothorax and maybe you get kind of sick from it. You're in the hospital for a little bit longer than those four days. It gives you some reserve and allows you to get back on your feet quicker than if you hadn't gone through pulmonary rehab. Okay, great. We had some, some questions prior to the actual start of the program for some, from some registrants. Um, is asthma actually considered COPD and why or why not? So asthma by definition is different. Um, you know, asthma by purest definition is reversible airflow obstruction, meaning that we give you an, an inhaler and it should go, your lung function should go back to normal. Now there are some asthmatics that have fixed airflow obstruction because they've had asthma for years and years and years, but it is different. Asthma also is more strictly of an airway problem. So you don't get emphysema with asthma. You'll just get the airway issues and the airway problems. What gets really confusing is that there are many people who are asthmatics. And again, I'm going to refer back to you, Patty, not to embarrass you or anything, but you, your story is perfect. I mean, you described how you had asthma your, you know, since you were younger. You did your thing. You're exercising and playing sports, et cetera, but you also smoke. So that gave you the opportunity, unfortunately, it happens, you got COPD on top of the asthma. So you can certainly have both, but asthma is really different than COPD, although the symptoms are the same, right? Shortness of breath, cough, right. wheeze, mucus, but like Penny described, her asthma, she might get a flare up or get treatment, but she always got better. Whereas right. COPD, she might get a little better, but she never really felt back to normal again. Right. And then we have a question from Judith Martin. She wants to know how old is too old for the procedure? <laughs> so, the, the, you know, as a general rule, we don't have a, a strict cutoff. Maybe Gigi can interject here if, if, if there's a real strict cutoff, but we'll, we'll accept people, you know, up, certainly anyone in their 70s is eligible. Above that, into their 80s, it's going to have to be a case by case discussion. Uh, you know, probably if you're 85 or 90, this procedure is not going to be much benefit to you. Um, but, you know, each person needs to be considered on an individual pay basis. Uh, Gigi, do you have anything to add to that? Because this comes to you all the time, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, that's correct, Dr. Makari, what, he's, what you said. It's uh, the most we have done is 82. Uh, and the patient was had no other condition other than emphysema. My heart was fine. Everything else was fine. So, yes, it's uh, anything above until we do Till 80, it's okay. And anything above 80 is case by case basis. Okay, great. Um, so I have another question from Charlotte Michelski. She wants to know, do people need to be recommended for participation in our clinical trials at Temple by their pulmonary doctors? Or can they just, you know, access this on their own? Well, either way is fine. I mean, we have uh, some pulmonologists will know about a trial and they'll refer their patient to Temple to see if they could be a candidate for that trial. Certainly, uh, you can go to our website and there's a, a, a way to get linked into clinical trials on your own too. So it could be either. Um, you could be referred, or you could just contact us yourself. And I'm sure, so, oh, here you go. Um, so Heather's already put that up there for us. The phone number is 215-707-1359. You can call yourself or you can be referred. Okay, great. Penny, I want you to kind of answer this from the patient perspective. Okay. We have um, Gloria Delarada. She wants to know why pulmonary rehab over just going to the regular gym? What did you get more out of pulmonary rehab compared to when you were in the gym? Well, everything there was geared towards your breathing. So they, they give you a lot of education at the pulmonary rehab to get your diaphragm, to open and close your diaphragm and how to breathe much better. So 
all of the exercise is geared towards that. It's not just to build up muscle and, and strength and all that, which it can do, but it's to, to educate you on how to breathe. Maybe when you're out of breath, what to do instead of panicking. Um, they, there, there's a lot of different ways like purse lip breathing, um, different things that you can do, but they, they give you a lot of education while you're there. Okay. I mean, you can go to the regular gym, but it's not, it's not, a lot of the exercise there are just to build strength and build up muscles. It's not geared towards breathing better. So it's really more like a program where you felt yes. like you were learning and building your strength. Yes, yes, definitely a, a lot of, I learned a lot of education. I mean, when you're walking upstairs, just <clears throat> one minor thing, instead of taking Breathing in when you're going up steps, you want to breathe out, let that air out as you're walking up the steps. Um, and there's just a, a, a few things, um, like I said, that they teach you. They teach you how to breathe. They teach you what to do, how to take your time doing different things instead of rushing. Sometimes the more you rush, the more panicked you get. So then when you panic, then your breathing is going to start getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So you have to kind of learn how to do things all over again. All right, so that was so that was a that was a great description from the patient telling you about what they've gotten out of pulmonary rehab. So I have a couple other questions. I have some questions regarding um, inhalers and why do we use them and what do they really do to help with our COPD? Okay, so and I'm going to shoot that over to Dr. Marchetti. So. Um, you know, I, I went through that very quickly in the talk, so we could focus more on the uh, latter half of the talk regarding lung reduction, et cetera. But the, the idea of the inhalers are one to, we call bronchodilate, make the airways bigger. If the airway's a little bit bigger, then you can get air out easier. So the use of inhaled medications reduces shortness of breath, it improves how far you can walk, and it lowers the lung volumes. The other medication we use through an inhale, inhaled device, an inhaler, is an inhaled corticosteroid. So it's an inhaled steroid. The idea of this is that the steroid, you know, doesn't get throughout your whole body. It's not systemically absorbed. You're not a pill. Or we're not giving it to you through your vein, but it stays in the lung. And that's been shown to reduce exacerbations and flare-ups. So the mainstay of treatment for patients with more significant or severe disease is that you're on what we call triple therapy. You're on two medicines that cause bronchodilation two different ways and this inhaled steroid. Now, does every single inhaler work the same in every patient? The answer is no. There are different inhalers out there and the brands don't really matter, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, a long acting beta agonist, which is a long acting form of albuterol is a long acting beta agonist. But what does differ between the different devices that are out there is how they're delivered. Some are delivered through what's called a dry powdered inhaler. Some of them are delivered through how albuterol is, you know, a meter dose inhaler. Some of them can be given through the nebulizer. And it's not the changing bronchodilators or changing inhalers because one doesn't work or one is stronger than the other, but it might just be as simple as A, teaching the patient how to use the inhaler or switching it up to something that works better for them, whether it's a dry powdered inhaler or a nebulized version. That's what we use the inhalers for. I knew the, nebu the nebulizer is a big help. Uh, even though the, as, as good as I'm feeling, I still use the nebulizer first thing in the morning when I get up. I use that and depending on what kind of a day it is, if it's a real humid day out and I've been outside a lot, I might come in and give myself another treatment with the nebulizer. Um, that opens up your, your lungs and opens your airway up. And I, I find a big, big advantage to, to using a nebulizer. Thank you, honey. So I have a question from Jerry Evans. He is looking for information on stem cell therapy and how it helps people with COPD. So um, I'll try to answer that one. I mean, this is an area in, in COPD that's extremely controversial. So um, stem cell therapy in theory should work very well. So the idea is that you take a cell that hasn't yet developed into a lung or an arm or a leg or a heart or a liver or whatever organ it is and you put it in the right environment 
and it will regenerate and form whatever you want it to do, make it a lung tissue, et cetera. This, you know, it can be done in petri dishes and, and with the right formulation, but it's not yet being used in, in patients. Now, I think uh, you mentioned that you had stem cell therapy. And so what they do there, there are a couple centers across the country, one's in Pittsburgh, one's in Florida. These are, they take, I think they take some blood from your arm and, and, and isolate the stem cells and give it back to you. This has not been proven in any clinical trial to be effective. Um, it's not approved by the FDA. Uh, it's not been studied uh, scientifically or rigorously. Uh, so we don't know if it works. Some people will tell you, uh, like, like our, 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 our patient said, that, hey, it helped them. But many patients say it has done nothing. Um, so it's a very controversial area. As of now, we can't recommend it because there's not been any studies done. That doesn't mean that people aren't trying it, but we have no information that it can help or not. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Marchetti, for that answer. And it looks like we're out of time for today. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for being on this uh, call with us today, for all of your questions, for taking time out of your day. I hope you guys received really valuable information, and that can hopefully help you make good choices in um, your COPD treatment and where you choose to go. If you're interested in making an appointment with a Temple pulmonologist, um, I think Heather put up in the chat the contact for um, Gigi and her email to, to get scheduled at Temple Lung. And if you have any questions, Gigi is also very happy to answer them. And if you look in the chat, his number is in the chat, 215-707-4094. And here we have Heather's, uh, Heather's contact, and you can provide your name, date of birth, and phone number to request an appointment. Thank you guys again, and you have a, a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And uh, okay. Penny, I just want to say thanks to you as well for coming on and providing some real life uh, answers here. You're very welcome. And, and I'll owe you $5 for that pulmonary rehab contact. <laughs> I'll, I'll comment later. <laughs> just kidding. Thank you so much, Penny. Thank you, Dr. McCuddy. You're welcome. See you next Good time. Good job, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. All.